This particular topic, assessing the potential of high potentials, has been one that has fascinated me for many years. In fact, as I thought about this particular piece today, um, I reflected on the initial talent management experience I had back in the late 80s and early 90s when I was the chief uh, talent and HR and leadership development executive for a financial services company. And we had departments of anywhere between 30 to 120 people that I said a grace over, if you will, and worked with. And I'll never forget in those early days, uh, I would make my own private little grid. It was, it was a simple grid. It was a, uh, two by two, and one sort I did were who were the employees that I experienced as um, certainly above average performers, and that was the A bucket, and then everybody else in the B bucket. And then I, at, in a sort of crude way, thought about who had the right stuff, and then there, there was everybody else. And so the A bucket, of the better performers and the right stuff um, were the people that today we would probably label and call and respond to as high potentials. And this, of course, preceded any nine boxes and preceded the conversation on learning agility and those kinds of things. And as I, as I in those, the crude way I just described, um, started making notes about those people in the A bucket with the right stuff. And um, over the years in that role, I, I had any number of employees who would come in. And of course, when you get to be the age uh, I am and you have a chance to follow people, I have been so extraordinarily fascinated that the people who were in that bucket, both the high performers and the, the, um, uh, the right stuff people, where they've ended up in their careers and almost to the person they've either become the chief uh, fill in the blank IT or chief HR or chief uh, in some cases the customer service division of the corporations where they went to work later on in their careers or uh, started their own businesses where they have actually been very successful. So when Bob Eichinger and I started having our conversations about high potentials and the measurement of high potentials, of course, Bob um, and Mike Lombardo had been paying attention to this question as well, independently, and we started comparing notes, uh, which brought us to a perspective about the whole nature of potential. And uh, as we like to say, potential's a real thing. Uh, just like people will say extroversion and introversion is a real thing, we would say to you, potential is a real thing. And as we get into the topic, I just want to, you know, remind everybody that um, Bob and I, uh, Bob Eichinger and I have been busily uh, focused on leveraging our knowledge and experience and research over the years uh, for uh, what we think of as the uh, talent management needs of today's organization. And of course, you can't or you wouldn't want to avoid the potential question. And being clear, at least in our world, about the nature of potential and how that plays out, uh, what are the key markers and drivers has really been our focus. And the whole question of assessment of potential uh, raises its own questions and its own challenges, which I'll touch on as we go through today. Throughout this journey that Bob and I have been on, um, both of us being evidence-based folk, uh, we like to know what, on the, like for the topic of potential, 
what are the relevant data points that we want to take a look at and how reliable and valid are the data sources that we wanted to make sure that we leveraged. Um, the question of, well, do the data that, that's currently available, um, are those data uh, actually sufficient to cover the territory based on uh, the experiences that we have? And amongst the fields, now that especially the potential and high potential question has become uh, one where we actually have conferences on today, what seem to be the consensually recognized facts of, of potential and high potential. And having said that, um, we know that as data evolves and as uh, things shift and change, we shift our opinions of, about what a recognized fact may be, especially in the field of uh, looking at human behavior. Um, paying attention to the trends and patterns enables us, of course, to find out what the viable relationships are that all of us who want to be uh, the kinds of professionals that I know we do want to be. We want to be the caring, thoughtful professionals who are basing our conversations on relevant uh, data points. Um, to provide the kind of analysis and understand the kind of outcomes and consequences of applying the data that we have. So just know that in everything Bob and I have done, we, we started with the question of what's really vital. And in this question, this particular area, what's really vital, what evidence is there around potential and high potential? The sources that we've pulled on and have come from a whole variety of uh, arenas, uh, as you see listed on the screen, I'm not gonna read all that to you, you can see it. We know that folks have been interested in eagerly writing about this question. And of course, because it is such a significant question, um, there are lots of organizations who will say, come and, step inside the tent with us and we'll show you our highly proprietary information on potential. So we know that be above and beyond what I have listed here, there are other sources where folks have been looking at the potential question. Um, I made a little note here about the NFL, but only because if any of you have poked around in the field, you've probably come across a number of references to the NFL's effort to measure potential. And um, they use the Wanderlich test of cognitive ability to, in their prog uh, projections. And of course, it hasn't proven to be as helpful as they thought, but what it has done, unfortunately, <laughs> is um, created some biases that uh, players who have high scores ask too many questions and are more difficult to deal with because they complexify things. Um, and there is a series of stories that suggest that uh, Tom Brady, for example, was ignored because his Wonderlick scores were too high. And um, people didn't, uh, football franchises were a little weary of dealing with a young man who seem to have lots of questions and analysis of things going on at the time. If you to go follow up on that research, you, you'll find it an interesting series of studies and explorations about uh, this kind of question, not suggesting that the Wonderlich test is necessarily a measure of potential, but certainly um, one which, which uh, the NFL has tried to use. When we look at potential and we will find in multiple sources that uh, the question of potential is about how an individual will perform in the future in new and more complex roles. And um, one of the biggest sources of confusion that keeps coming up whenever I talk to organizations about their efforts to look at potential, it almost always is overly weighted on performance variables as opposed to the kinds of elements that make potential, as I said at the beginning, a real thing. Um, and 
if we are trying to really identify potential, there's all kinds of very good reasons for it. Number one, uh, we want to identify those who, in fact, over the arc of their career can take enough and get enough and have enough experiences that they can become future C-suite uh, execs and leaders uh, and be a part of the succession plan. And as we um, identify uh, a talent and for the enterprise, we know that that potential and lining up potential and lining up how people are to be um, oriented in their learning helps build sustainability in the organization. If we went looking through all the research, we'd find that there's just all kinds of stuff about, well, potential for what and potential for when and um, is the potential for being the CEO the same as the potential for being the CFO is the same as the potential for um, a person who's in manufacturing versus a person who, let's say, is in financial management? Um, are we talking about very specific roles and functions? Are we uh, clear about the separation between performance and potential? And of course, those who, who study it and look at it and try to publish um, key papers on it uh, want to identify the role of cognitive factors, how personality plays into the demonstration of potential, what a person's learning patterns are like, the degree of motivation they exhibit, um, the ways in which performance may play into, uh, growing potential as well as uh, leadership factors and some have even identified situational or cultural elements that they believe pay, play in uh, potential. We, we see that those who take a more what I'll call developmental psychology approach or personal psychological approach tend to look at personality pieces like dominance and social ability and how flexible or open a person is, what their achievement orientation may be, we look at measures of curiosity and how individuals manage ambiguity. And almost all folks who write about profiles of folks with potential, and especially high potential, uh, take a look at uh, those variables. And of course, cutting across the industry, as is all things related to our field, is do we have accurate and complete measurement? Are, are we accurately measuring potential? And are we making sure that the measurement is giving us a complete picture? So if we take a look at the most uh, consistent factors like cognitive skills, or mindsets, the, and I'm putting systems thinking as a part of the mindset, we could easily begin to talk about Kagan's uh, framework on cognitive uh, parameters and identify the system thinking perspective that's there. Um, certainly, uh, there's a lot in the social skills, EQ skills arena that plays into effective use of potential, um, as well as drive, achievement, and, and ambition measures. The problems <clears throat> that you'll find in the literature, and I quite frankly will um, suggest to you that I think really are uh, serious issues in the assessment of potential, uh, have to do with um, how reliant any kind of self-report elements are in measuring potential in an organization. Uh, and we'll all say more about self-report limitations, but um, they are rather significant in considering the key factors in potential. Um, there are all an array of studies on observer biases primarily because of a lack of framing or protocols in the way individuals are, are rated. Um, the domains that are often used to get at potential are incomplete. 
Um, just because you have a, a really good coverage of EQ doesn't mean you've covered the bases. And of course, as in all assessment, is how do we deal with the standard error of measure? And that poses the question of the problem of false positives and false negatives. And that's a pretty serious issue um, because as we know, in any kind of assessment of human behavior, you desperately are looking for ways to reduce measurement error. And you want to because if you have false positives, meaning people who are identified as having potential, but ultimately they don't, then there are certain outcomes to expect. It's these individuals tend to be put in challenges uh, too quickly. They tend to burn out uh, very fast. They tend to be folks who seemed very promising, but um, as it turned out, the, the key variables that would have enabled them to be successful simply um, weren't there as well as uh, you want to uh, reduce false rejections, meaning someone who's not identified, it doesn't seem to hit the cutoff point, they're rejected, but in fact, um, if we follow them over time, they prove to be extraordinary uh, individuals. So um, clearly, to my point, uh, we wanna develop assessments and develop mechanisms of assessing and appraising to have true positives and true negatives and as few false positives and false rejections as possible. I, I will just as a personal story tell you that I um, was in constant war with school systems over this issue because many of the assessments that are used to identify which kids go into which particular kinds of programs have significant measurement error, such that there were lots of kids who were being falsely rejected um, or put in programs that were not good fits developmentally, uh, creating a host of problems and issues. And of course, organizationally, today in, in our organizations, these errors can be extremely expensive. All of us know how much it takes to uh, bring a person, to onboard a person, to make sure that they're in the best role for them and make sure they, they are given the kind of career opportunities that make the most sense. And when that's out of alignment and we lose them, we lose that investment, we lose that talent, and we lose that energy and commitment and, um, that can be extremely costly over time. And of course, as we know, as a person moves up in their career, the misfit exec tends to be um, found out and kicked out for a whole variety of reasons. And um, that's not good for the organization and not good for the individual. So we take this assessment question very seriously and when I talk about our assessment around high potentials and potential in general, um, understand in the back of our minds, it's, it's critical that we um, develop a methodology and a process that reduces the false positives and false rejections. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that Bob and I did as we took up the question of high potentials, we began to ask, well, not only what does the previous research tell us, and what are some of the more recent uh, research elements telling us, and how were those research pieces completed, uh, we decided that uh, we would take a look at extraordinary people, and uh, looking at the biographical information of extraordinary people can be in and of itself, uh, spectacularly fascinating. And as you begin to do that, and you begin to study extraordinary people who've done extraordinary things, um, you find that there are some patterns across the fields of extraordinary people um, that keep showing up uh, and keep making 
the kinds of uh, behavioral differences uh, that we want to pay attention to. Then, of course, at, but as I said earlier, Bob and I have had loads of experience in our talent management fields and in different arenas. And we made notes uh, over the years about all that and said to ourselves, well, gee, I know the researchers say, uh, for example, uh, achievement orientation is vital and that's not sufficient. There's, there's more to it than that. Um, there's more to the drive, the achievement drive. There's something else that's broader um, that we need to talk about and we need to gather data on. And of course, coaching individuals, um, you quickly know when you start coaching a person um, that whether or not that individual is in that, what we might call that high potential uh, range. Um, and coaching them, you begin to deal with them a little differently. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the three kinds of things that you pay attention to in analyzing the data, of course, is um, how well-founded the self-report data pieces are and how have the biases embedded in those um, accounted for, as well as observer bias, and as I said earlier, um, measurement error challenges. And the thing about the interpersonal pieces, we've known for a long time that individuals as a general rule uh, overrate themselves interpersonally. And we know this because um, the evidence is so compelling. When a person says, I am the most empathetic person at the office, and you ask people, well, tell me about the empathy of, of person X and you you get these quizzical looks what do you mean empathy this person hasn't been empathetic on anything in my experience and you begin to realize oh there's a pattern here when it comes to interpersonal skills uh, we tend to have a higher sense of our effectiveness than people who are around us experience and in fact in at least in my mind the parallel is that all of the data that's been collected in the last decade, primarily by the Center for Creative Leadership, where they ask um, executives, you know, how, how often and at what complexity do you give feedback to the people you're managing? And overwhelmingly, they report that they regularly give feedback and they really zero in on what's important. And then when you ask the same employees of those managers, how often do you get feedback? And they say, well, rarely. And whenever the feedback's offered, it's virtually useless. So we, we tend to have this sense about ourselves interpersonally, which um, is, and of course, not absolutely everyone, but overwhelmingly the data shows we, we are biased in those reports and therefore uh, using those kinds of things in determining potential and high potential is highly suspect. Now, um, those of you who've been involved in high potential assessments and appraisals for years know that if you've got um, a talent management process at work or system at work inside the organization, you you really are trying to get as much data on observed behaviors as possible. You want to look for the trail of evidence that a person has not just been a flash in the pan on a particular uh, arena, but in fact has shown uh, the complexity of markers and drivers and the patterns of behaviors where they are the kind of learner and the kind of individual who seems to uh, exude uh, this sense of challenge and opportunity and the look for greater opportunities to perform in, in the future. And of course, we all know that the, the simple question when you're talking to a person, you know, tell me about a time when, and you might 
you might say, solved a particularly complex problem, or tell me about a time when you manage change in an organizational setting. And as you get that kind of data, um, you begin to see patterns in the ways in which a person uh, describes and shares and demonstrates and has evidence of um, engaging in the kinds of things that we know are connected to potential. And as it turns out today, based on any number of additional studies, uh, it, having observed behaviors and doing the interviews and understanding a person's uh, behavior from others' perspectives across settings are uh, best to do. It also turns out that three factors, such as the mobility of the individual, uh, in some organizations, that's, that may not be a big deal, but in a lot of organizations today, um, those folks with potential, and especially the high potentials, may need experiences in different settings. And the person who's unwilling to relocate um, is limiting the range of their experience. The perception of the gestalt, if you will, of alignment, either with the culture or with the leader framing or leader uh, values, if you will, of the enterprise become particularly important. You know, your person might have a lot of the right behaviors, except there's this strong sense that they simply do not fit in the culture. Um, and that becomes an important message when paying attention to high potential. So when at least I've thought about this and tried to put pencil to paper, uh, when I think about potential, the knowledge and skills and attributes to take on increasingly complex and demanding work, as we know, this is on a range. Um, it goes from uh, those individuals who, who simply love SOPs. They like standard operating procedures and they want to be very hands-on, concrete learners. And we need lots of those people in the organization. We need people who, who love all the rules of accounting and who want to spend their lives being the most perfect accountant. Um, those individuals, uh, we give them some increasing demands as they're willing to take on. Um, but they become deep pros and that's good to celebrate that those individuals are in that space. And then of course, there's a middle group of people who like some challenges, but they are also uh, conservers of energy. They're careful risk takers and perhaps will take on a moderate level challenge or set of challenges, still liking their roles defined. And we're glad to have them in organizations. I mean, uh, they hold value in an, in an array of special projects and special challenges that we want to have them uh, engage in. Then, of course, there is the person whose aspirations are extraordinarily high. They are constantly in pursuit of taking initiative. They are perpetually wanting feedback and love complexity. And um, they're on full what I call for bore growth um, in everything they do and they get bored quickly in it, when they master the challenge they're ready for the next and of course um, they fit the bill of the high potential as I've suggested here uh, in this continuum. As Bob and I tried to settle on what are the main markers and uh, drivers of potential based on all the data we had gathered and all the things we had explored, what are those things that when these are present, we know that um, there is this extraordinary uh, individual that we put in the high potential bucket. And of course, to lesser degrees of these attributes, they get to go in more of the middle bucket. And when these aren't present, it isn't that they don't have value to the organization. It's simply 
that they become the deep pros of the organization, assuming that the performance is there, the learning, ongoing learning adjustments within their profession is there, um, and we, we want to keep them happy and uh, promoted and supported in, in their work. When Bob and I settled on our uh, markers, uh, as you look at the list, uh, you, you won't be surprised as you think about the individuals with high potential that you've known. Um, and uh, I, I don't mind saying uh, Bob and I have used the word always and constant and relentless in a number of our descriptions and people push back on that and they've said, well, there's no such thing as always. And we would say to you, yeah, high potentials always. <laughs> they, are, they are always showing uh, the certain kind of energy that is substantially different from um, the energy of others. And what we would say to you, or at least I feel confident in saying to you is, all of these have varying degrees of um, malleability. So for example, a learner, a learning a new job quickly, a person might actually need to be exposed to a variety of ways to learn. And if they're quick learners, they learn the new ways to learn and become very effective. So that's a more malleable quality, if you will. Um, Whereas the individual who seeks variety and diversity, that seems to be highly built in. They seem to have that switch and it's on and it's on full speed, uh, perpetually looking for the opportunities of taking on new and greater challenges. Um, I would say to you, I, I see more malleability with those who learn to network and can be taught to network more effectively, which is quite different from the capacity to see past the mountains, the metaphorical mountains in front of you, to see through them and to see the opportunities on the other side of it and what happens on the other side of it, um, or whatever the challenge may be. So as Bob and I uh, settled on these markers and drivers, we also, um, as has been in all the libraries we've created, we said, well, now let's look at the practices. What are the behavioral practices associated with these particular markers? And as we did that analysis, we found um, that there are practices which um, are highly associated with aspiring to greatness, not so associated with seeing past mountains highly associated with embracing and leading change, not so associated with an exemplar of lifelong learning. So um, it is the practices where there's greater opportunity, um, if you will, to uh, mold and develop behavior. Now we've also uh, coded all of the practices to various learning experiences. So we we went through and analyzed what are all the main learning experiences inside of enterprises um, that a person can expect in their career or, or perhaps opportunities that could be there in their career. And we've said, well, given the practices that are associated with these markers and drivers, what are the kinds of experiences that should an individual engage in and they maximize the experience would give you um, the kind of background to know this high potential is going to make a significant contribution. Now, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the problems or underside, especially of the high potential population. And um, you may have seen the old Star Trek episode, The Problem with Tribbles, uh, these very capable organisms, if you will, who were also extraordinarily annoying. And what we found uh, is that when we started looking at these attributes and how they show up and how do we know when they're in trouble, meaning if, if we aren't attentive to these pieces, um, we could unintentionally 
um, not protect the high potential that we want to protect and unintentionally um, be in a situation where we're not giving them the feedback they need to make the adjustments that they need to, to make. And here, here's the thing, these folks, the folks who have these markers and drivers, which I talked about a moment ago in their constitutional presence, if you will, in day-to-day -day life, are folks who tend to be impatient. When they are working with other people, they rapidly evaluate their competence. Um, they don't feel the rules necessarily apply to them. They often get into political trouble. They don't mind asking the CEO why a decision was made and the way it was made, and if in fact the CEO paid attention to various other sorts of pieces of information. And depending on the culture of the organization, that may or may not be good news. Um, they tend to be fairly right in problem solving. They see things, integrate things fairly quickly. Um, and that, of course, uh, gets to be a bit annoying to others when they're pushing um, their perspective uh, before other people have fully understood um, their perspective. Uh, they are lightning rods because they do things and get away with things that, that people feel like these are problem uh, individuals and they can be problem individuals if not properly coached and oriented to their role. Um, they do get bored very quickly as a general rule. Their expectations about their careers are uh, often quite high. They articulate that and will make it clear that they will go somewhere else to get the experience that they want. And in, I would say, sophisticated talent management systems, you might in fact encourage them to go get experience in another setting for various kinds of things. And then of course, let them know you're wanting them to come back. You're wanting them to uh, come back to the organization and, and after they've had uh, this particular experience. They tend to be seen because they're smart, quick, they come, they analyze things very completely. They tend to be seen as go-to people, or they, certainly up and rising folks, and the fact that they're faster than others um, is almost perpetually present in the ways in which they tackle challenges and issues. Now, um, I am sure if you've ever been a talent manager and you've dealt with high potentials who exhibit some of these behaviors, you knew you had to be their guardian angel and find ways to put them in places where um, these kinds of behaviors did not undermine their careers because you knew that as they learn and as they grew over time, their opportunities and their contributions were going to be so much more significant. So um, we know there's an underside of the energies demonstrated around these markers and drivers. And as talent managers, we should be attuned to those and certainly as coaches be attuned to those and listening in for um, the person who is talking about how bored they are, they don't see career opportunities, or all the various kinds of things that are listed here, that you as a coach um, might in fact want to be attentive to and, and make sure that they are aware you know of their pain, if you will, and come up with strategies to help them uh, deal with the frustration or the challenges in order to be as successful as possible. Now, um, having identified the markers and the practices, of course, uh, led us to questions about what is the best way uh, that we think the measurement of potential uh, really uh, can be uh, utilized? What are the things that we think people should do? And of course, the talent talk conversations that we think are vital, you've, you know about those, you've heard about those, I'm sure you've read about those where you have your own talent management committee made up of managers and executives and HR professionals who take a look at 
um, where your talent is and their experience and what they're doing. You look at their profiles, you look at the multiple data sources, the observational data, independent measures that can be collected. Um, all of those should be a part of uh, the discussion. And one of the ways we think to facilitate that is how do we make sure that when we are coming together to talk about the data, that it is as scientifically based as possible, that when we listen to the talent stories, we're attuned to the inherent biases in those stories. And I'm gonna say something that I don't intend to be offensive, I really don't. I'm saying something that is just factual, and that is that there are many hiring managers who um, aren't themselves in the high potential pool, and because they haven't, they don't have a cogent framework around it, they don't tend to identify the high potentials in the way we've just been talking about it. They identify individuals as high potential that either is a lot like them or <laughs> they've learned in the system that when the system identifies high potentials, they take them out. So they identify the individuals who are problematic and want the talent management system to take them out of their area and move them to somewhere else. And so we know that those things happen. And so it's incumbent upon those involved in the talent talk conversation to become as trained and aware and attuned to the markers and drivers and the practices so that you can hear um, the behavioral points and you can question and explore um, data that's being shared in talent stories about uh, the individual. And of course, we think that um, we, we need to be mindful that uh, when it comes to everybody, but especially high potentials, um, they are busily doing what has been satisfying to their brain oftentimes, as Bob and I looked at it, from early days in childhood all the way up through their college and uh, work careers. Um, there were attributes that just kept being fed, reinforced, such that these were natural um, qualities to them uh, from the earliest of days where it was, it was easy to see. And so trying to push against any of those uh, drivers and markers is pushing against significant headwinds. And we would suggest that as coaches and facilitators uh, being attuned to how we help them work around um, how some of those behaviors play out becomes really important. As we all know from the neuroscientists that the neurons that fire together, wire together, and um, it is maximally true for high potentials that their pathways internally are huge. Now, I, I see this problem, the no, the no do get problem, one for us, meaning golly wow, so we know these things about high potential, so what do we do about it and how do we act on it? Likewise, the high potentials that we've identified or those with potential that we wanna give broader experiences to, um, do we know the kinds of things to do that will enable them to be as successful as possible? And it is a stretch and it does require us to um, go over the gap as professionals to help people get from point A to point B. Now, uh, in our process, we, as I think everybody here knows, we, we have put our IP for all of our libraries, not only our high potential library, but our um, knowledge, skills, and attributes library for leaders, and the one, the library for managers, and the library for individual contributors and the library for teams in cards so that um, folks can begin to create profiles and have prompters of gosh what's really most important or most present or most descriptive depending on how you're sorting the data um, we know that getting individuals as well as groups of people to sort about the attributes that 
really make a difference um, in a particular setting is a good thing to do. Now, we have, as I mentioned earlier, an array of placemats or analytical sheets that enable people to see the patterns, trends, and the codings between each of the practices and the drivers in the case of potential, as well as um, the kinds of job experiences that are relevant to individuals who are um, in this space. And as coaches, uh, we'll want to make sure, or talent managers make sure that they're getting the experience that they need. Now, as we put our thoughts together on this and we thought about the assessment questions and challenges, you know, having, having for example, using the cards as an interview tool is fabulous. I, I as a coach, I've done this many times. I've taken the cards and I've asked people, tell me about a time when um, these behaviors were present and the richness of information you can get and the data that you gather then having the cards as prompters is extraordinary. Likewise, um, we've developed two reports that can be used. One we call the Career Path Report, which is a 360 designed for development, and that works just like all of our 360s. Um, there are five reports available. There's a combined report, there's, there's um, a placemat report, there's a just sort of basic data report, um, and it can be converted to what we call the career path report if all of the drivers and practices were included in the 360 data gathering. So in the 360 piece, sure enough, boss or bosses, peers, direct reports, clients, customers, others can do the ratings and you can see um, how a person is experienced across uh, different domains um, around these particular drivers and practices. Our career path report is, is special because here, only because we know data-wise, managers tend to be, um, and previous supervisors tend to be very accurate, um, very clear-minded in the way they see behavior play out. And so if the manager or managers who are asked to rate an individual complete um, the career path report, they uh, will do their ratings. The individual who's being rated will not receive a report. And in fact, we encourage that you don't even tell the individual that a rating is going on. The manager will not see the report who does the rating. Um, the consultant who's been hired to help with the career talent question or the management committee, the talent committee, who's been trained on using the career path report will have a chance to have that whole report. Now, what, what makes this report so exceptional is that we have an algorithm which produces a career potential index in the report. And it has to have all of the drivers and all the practices for the index to give you a measure. And in it, we provide a global norm comparison. Uh, if you have enough data in a particular organization, we've programmed this that if you have let's say at least 30 managers in an organization who are being rated, you can see the normative data on the career path index um, and that tells you on the potential index in this setting, here is the percentile rank of each and every one of the 30 managers. And we've seen now companies who are using this in their talent talk where they literally, um, use the potential index score and the placement element of the report and use it, post it, and have everyone talk about each and every one of the individuals who are thought of as going in the high potential pool and take a look at what people see as their strengths, what are the areas that they tend to be um, 
potential problem areas, meaning the underbelly of, of the high potential and how to manage that in the most productive and meaningful way. And so the career path report becomes one of those highly protected data sources that um, you would use in a talent management discussion. And we think it's extremely important that the algorithm, uh, we've now tested that algorithm multiple ways uh, and we know the algorithm is robust. Now that is not sufficient, that is a data point. It should drive conversation in a variety of ways, um, but it isn't the singular data point on which to make a decision about high potential placement. As I mentioned earlier, uh, all of our libraries are set up similarly in terms of uh, having in the libraries, the, the, the leader, manager, and individual contributor libraries, we have roles and practices. In the high potentials and teams libraries, we have drivers and, and practices uh, that we get people to talk about. And yes, we have color-coded the libraries to make them easy to identify. Um, the potential library is red and the teams is purple. Um, and you see uh, the colors associated with each of our libraries that people can access depending on um, the development conversation that you want to have. Now, the other thing we've done it, with the high potential and the team library, we have now cross-coded all of the drivers and practices with all of the libraries so that no matter where a person is in the organization, you as the talent manager or the coach uh, can easily see what are the kinds of behaviors that uh, are gonna need the most attention through the arc of their career or wherever they are in their career. Um, and uh, that is extremely helpful data to have as you are thinking about how you coach or lead, if you will, uh, potentials through uh, their career opportunities. Now, I um, am open to questions and observations and would ask, as, as I've looked in the chat space, no one, or at least I don't see any questions uh, typed here. Um, I'm happy because we're a small group to have you open your microphone. If you would like to ask a question or make an observation, uh, please feel free to do that now. Hey, this is, uh, this is Michael. Um, I have a quick question just on the, on the undersides of high potentials that you highlighted it seems to very much you know skew towards you know a profile that looks very non-emotionally intelligent non-organizationally savvy how do, how do you account for that in you know in, in assessment of high potentials and, and you know ultimately the, the you know development of a high potential that may need to lead an organization in a much more emotionally intelligent and organizationally savvy way in the future well, and I think your observation is, is uh, right on, meaning those who have high emotional intelligence, those problem areas aren't present. <laughs> they, they have enough self-regulation and self-management to realize, yes, they are impatient, and that's not necessarily a good thing. And yes, they may um, not be as attentive out of an urge or response, and they need to be. Um, so I would say, yes, you're right, that um, individuals who, whose emotional intelligence, either because of lessons learned or inherent qualities in their personality makeup, uh, tend to have their own governors on those behaviors, and they're not as evident. Um, it, it, it may be internally they're screaming about the competence of individuals that they're working with, but... <laughs> They don't dem dem demonstrate it because they're cognizant as to 
uh, the outcome um, if they engage in deleterious kinds of uh, declarations or statements or the ways in which people are treated. So um, I would say, based on at least the data I've gathered over time, the higher emotionally intelligent high potentials uh, often don't have that those issues or problems and very much um, are the kind, they exhibit the kind of optimism that's contagious and that people very much want to be a part of. So uh, I, I appreciate your question. I, I see there's one that's popped up on the chat space about certification. Obviously in a COVID-19 world, we are shifting our certifications all to, to a virtual digital experience and we're in that process now. Um, there are many folks who by virtue of previous training um, and we can have this individual conversation with you. We, we will approve you in using uh, the CASAT material because you, your experience and your knowledge uh, merits that. Uh, there are plenty of qualified people out there who uh, just need to be uh, somewhat familiar with the content. Those who, for whom this is a whole new arena, we certainly are going to provide a mechanism to do it. And as I just said, uh, I, I, I would be interested, by the way, if any of you feel differently about this. Um, my, my hunch is the post-COVID-19 round one uh, outcome for a lot of training is going to be that um, there's a lot of this material that we need to be able to deliver through digital means and digital processes. And um, we, are, we are literally in the throes of doing that now. So if you will check our events calendar, you will see that we are able to um, have training programs listed there. If you are an individual who think you, you're already your experience, either with the learning agility material, or other potential measures, is such that you are uh, very comfortable with this arena, just give us a call, just reach out to me, and we'll set up a discussion and, and just make sure we're all aligned about how to be effective and, and uh, constructive with this material. So I appreciate that question. A any other questions while we yeah. have a little bit? Roger, this is Ronnie. <clears throat> so you mentioned a situation where you're sitting with uh, especially senior management who are looking at different people and trying to assess, but they themselves are not necessarily high potentials and in fact may see it as a threat. And to, I think you said something about uh, may want that person who is identified as high potential to actually be in a different area, i.e. not represent a threat. In situations, especially where people got to these senior positions because of their fr uh, functional expertise, not necessarily managerial and leadership expertise, how have you dealt with that uh, to get the group or the individuals to actually continue the process and somehow, if possible, at least partially, park their individual self-bias uh, on the side, to the side? Um, Thank you for the, the question and the challenge is really very interesting as you implied in your question when it's there <laughs> and there are times when you, you take a deep breath and you realize, okay, this group needs some a potential education 101, uh, meaning, well, and, and all of us know and have tactics for putting in front of a group a way to open some doors about their understanding and to say, um, well, the evidence tells us that, and going through, let's say, for example, the 12 markers um, tells us that these things really make a big difference in the arc of a career of an individual who can take on ever increasing complex tasks. So <clears throat> let's go through the process of identifying illustrations. And when we don't have illustrations for the individuals we have under consideration, um, how can we check it out? What are ways in the system that we have 
uh, that we can find out whether or not uh, some of those uh, attributes are there. And I think working with folks as the ways in which we do, where we take a deep breath and say, okay, we, we, what people are telling you when they do that is they don't have a map in their head for how to make sense. It's not necessarily been a part of their experience per se, and they don't have a map that makes sense. So getting them a map, um, which is one of the, the nice things about our placement A, is it gives a map of the markers and the drivers so that people can begin to have a common language of potential uh, discussion. And using that as a basis, um, it enables us to move the conversation more intelligently and navigate around um, some of those biases. Um, and I think it's, it's a uh, constant challenge in some industries I have found, and I'm not going to identify what those industries are right now. Um, uh, there are some industries where this phenomenon is more present than in others. And um, the other extreme in uh, Roni is the, is the management team who believes they're all high potential and <laughs> who are absolutely convinced um, that yes, the markers make a lot of sense and they are the only ones who know um, <laughs> how that plays out. And, and we have to control for that one too by yeah. making sure we institute processes to gather additional data um, to try to help with it. So now there's a, a question I want to touch on before we leave, and I want to do this by going back to uh, here. Uh, the question, and I know I'm, a, I'm over time, for those of you who are sticking around, I, I do want to respond to the question, how, how does EQ show up here? And I would say to you that when done exceedingly well, for example, um, the whole ability to embrace and lead change effectively requires high EQ. I think, don't think any of us would, would argue that. The self-awareness and self-regulation elements are absolutely core and central to emotional intelligence, just like developing networks are so vital um, and based on how emotionally intelligent we may be. And I would propose to you, at least in all the data I've seen and all the experiences I've had with high EQ individuals, that their optimism and their growth orientation is, is just something to behold. Um, I'm thinking of uh, uh, when I was coaching a particular um, admiral in the Navy who may be the most emotionally intelligent individual I've ever had the privilege of working with, who, whose exemplar lifelong learning orientation for himself and others whose networks were, um, I, I cannot tell you the captains I interviewed who said I would step in front of any bullet uh, to prevent this man from being harmed because of the devotion that had been developed over years of his support and his willingness to help people through their challenges and adversity. So uh, it's, it's, in, it's baked in in many ways it, when the person is, uh, exhibiting those qualities and exhibiting those qualities well. So I want to thank you for participating today in your questions and hope that you will keep checking out our website and you'll check out other uh, conversations we're having in the future and that you will be healthy and well. We all know the rules of social distancing and how important that is at this particular time as we try to get a handle on containing this uh, virus and learning how we're going to manage in a world where COVID-19 and future health care challenges uh, uh, occur. So uh, I, I want to thank you very much and, 
engage us, please. And if you want to follow up and, and have more conversation about certification, with the SAT, I'm happy to have you do that. Until next time, uh, take care. <laughs>